much, David, and uh, thank you to the chairman again. Once more, this, uh, this last session highlighted the incredible controversies that we all have uh, talking about cuff repairs. Ten years from now, we're going to talk about the same things. You know, I'm, I'm listening in the back, uh, critical shoulder angles and partial tears, and, you know, I still don't know how to measure one millimeter on a cuff or one degree on an angle. And if it was 33.9 degrees and not 34 degrees, what do I do? Or if it's 29.8 degrees? So just understand for yourselves, these are concepts and perhaps not, not exactly what the literature says. We can all be seduced by the literature and it really leads to, it leads to this talk. You know, why, why do we use suture anchors to repair the rotator cuff? That's a really good question. You know, I trained in an era of open surgery, so I was trained with an open transosseous technique, the technique of Codman, multi-sutures through multiple tunnels, the technique popularized by McLaughlin, De Palma, Rowe, you know, Bateman, Near, Hawkins, Cofield. But then we started to decide that, uh, you know, we really needed to avoid the pain that was associated with rotator cuff repair surgery. For those of you who remember surgeries in the 90s, the people who were most upset besides your patients were your physiotherapists because they didn't want to take care of your patient after an open cuff repair because they were painful, they were stiff, they hurt. So we started this idea back in the 1980s of applying these devices into bone and, and I'll freely admit I probably have implanted more than 50,000 suture anchors in the greater tuberosity to repair the rotator cuff. But in my other life, besides being a soft tissue surgeon, I'm an arthroplasty surgeon. And so you do all these wonderful surgeries, right, and the x-rays look like this, and the cuff heals, looks perfect, and five years later the patient comes into your office, and it looks like this. So I'll ask you, how many people in the audience are very happy to see this patient with these x-rays come into your office? Raise your hand. Happy to see this patient be painful and come in, right? Look at all of these suture anchors and the tuberosity. Well, what about this patient? How many people are happy seeing all of these radiolucent anchors in the tuberosity? Why did we start to create radiolucent anchors? True question. Why did, we, why did peak evolve? Peak is not absorbable. Why? So that we don't see it and patients don't see it. It's pretty simple. So it's true. I was listening in the back and I, I heard beautiful lectures. Please, there's no, no criticism from me. But five anchors, six anchors in the greater tuberosity, really. You're talking about three and a half to four millimeter anchors, and you're talking about length of size, and now you're talking about all suture knot anchors, and you're destroying the bone that we need later on in life. We know the cuff heals from the bone, so really, I was faced with this problem back in the early 2000s, and there was no solution for me. I did not have a reverse arthroplasty in the United States until 2004. So in that way, we started over the course of time, almost 20 years ago, to go back to the idea of Codman to repair the rotator cuff without implants. Because truly, when you repair the rotator cuff with implants or anchors, it's a load-bearing repair, right? Regardless of whether it's one point, a single row, two points, a double row, transosis equivalent, it all squeezes the cuff load-bearing on the anchors. But the beautiful idea of Codman was that it's a load-sharing repair. The entire greater tuberosity is your anchor. So at the time, 20 years ago, there was just you know, a couple of crazy people doing this. And now, you know, look at yesterday. This uh, wonderful group from Madras is creating their own ideas. It's wonderful to see that we really have different way and a different approach. And I firmly believe that if this technique was available in some way to do an arthroscopic anchorless repair, we probably wouldn't have all of the companies making suture anchors. The other thing we have to realize is that the reason we can have meetings like this are because of the industry in the other room providing financial support. And the suture anchor market in the United States and worldwide for 2019 will be $2.8 billion. $2.8 billion just from little bolts in the bone, right? So if you decide to be a doctor, tell your kids to, to be an implant rep instead, okay? But really, here's, here's the truth of it. There, there is much literature to support anything that we want to do. We know this. You can have literature to support single rows, double rows, transosseous equivalents. But biomechanically, by and large, the mechanical repair of the way the tendon loads the bone of the proximal humerus is better with transosseous repair. It's very simple. The loading characteristics, Wolf's Law, Ruse Corollary, of how the cancellous bone is loaded in the tuberosity is much better if the entire tuberosity is enclosed. We know that the repair is better if you consider normal vascularity. So you know that suture anchor companies, and again, I'm not here to be critical of any company, but why do they have anchors with channels inside to have bone come? Because the tendon heals from the tuberosity itself, from the marrow elements. 
Well, we know that if we don't violate those marrow elements by putting an implant into it, perhaps we have a better chance for, for the tendon to heal. We know that there is a definite cost issue. You know, it, it breaks my heart that uh, the device that, uh, that I personally work with is really never going to be available in, in other countries simply because it's a disposable device per the FDA. The FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, prevents any device that has a deployable nitinol to be a disposable device. The device can be used multiple times, as Raghavir Reddy and other people know, but it, it can't be done, and so the companies can't do that. However, you now have different devices that allow you to make this reusable. Well, if it's reusable, you know, in order to repair even a one centimeter rotator cuff, even a partial repair, you must use at least one anchor or two anchors or three anchors. The vast majority of rotator cuff repairs involve at least two anchors. By and large, the cost if effectiveness of this type of repair is unquestioned. The repair is better for an operative time. You know, I, I'll submit to you that my residents come to me, they're skilled at putting anchors in, right? It's, it's really easy, you just tap it in the bone. But if you really take time to understand this, this is actually even quicker and easier. Because what happens if you put an anchor in the bone and break your suture? Or the anchor twists and comes out, you put another anchor in, right? Or another anchor, well, what do you do? You have to work around this bone. It's very easy to take the repair out and fix it. Post-operative pain. This is actually something that was taught to me. I heard the question yesterday. I don't know who asked about the scapular talk. They said, did you learn this or did your physiotherapist teach you? Well, my physiotherapist taught me this. The first time we started doing anchorless repairs in 2002, my therapist called me on the telephone, yeah, no text message then, called me on the telephone and said, what did you do differently? I said, nothing. He said, no, you did something different because the patient has less pain and they can recover their scapular proprioception. So we started to investigate this and we were not the first ones. This is the Italian group, the uh, group at Johns Hopkins. All of this literature I'm presenting is not ours. It's the literature that has been reported elsewhere at the same time. So this is our technique and I think it's important to, to take a little bit of time to go through this because I want to show you that this is not something that is, that is different. I heard the, uh, the question yesterday, has anyone else used the transosseous technique from the group from Madras? But I'll submit to you, this is no different from your anchor-based uh, techniques. This is our routine for arthroscopy of the shoulder to repair a rotator cuff. I operate in a modified beach chair position. We're viewing through a posterior lateral portal. I use the same four portals that I've used for over 20 years now. Posterior portal, posterior lateral, anterior lateral, and anterior portal. Where you would place your anchors medially just off the edge of the greater tuberosity, I place a tunnel. This is the strongest bone in the greater tuberosity, the subchondral bone just next to the tuberosity itself. And then laterally, the edge of the insertion of the tuberosity is approximately 15 millimeters below the top. So the bone bridge is the entire tuberosity. And this technique is not something so unique to me. This is what Dr. Neer taught to Dr. Hawkins, who taught to me with open surgery. Multiple sutures in multiple tunnels, distributing the points of fixation. For those of you who know who uh, Gulliver was and Gulliver's Travels, he was a giant who went into the land of the Lilliputians, the small people, but they held him down with multiple sutures. It's the same principle of the Calatrava bridges in Barcelona, multiple suspended cables distributing the stress across the tendon itself. McLaughlin was the first to tell us that in order to repair the rotator cuff and gain healing, we must prevent the synovialization of the fluid inside the joint traveling into the repair site. Well, Dr. Codman and Dr. Mueller elegantly demonstrated this is effectively done with multiple points of fixation. So personally for me, this is how I do it. For every 10 to 15 millimeters of cuff that's exposed, I place a tunnel. If the biceps is involved, I perform a simple tenodesis of the biceps. It's an all suture, you know, transosseous tenodesis. I personally don't use any implants anymore. You know, I, a wonderful uh, technique, uh, Radhikant was talking about using the biceps as a superior capsule reconstruction. I'll tell you that this is very easy to do with this type of a technique to swing the biceps over and incorporate it. But once you place tunnels in the bone, the technique itself is no different from how you would perform a, a classical anchor-based technique. You pass your sutures through the tendon, whether the suture pass is with an antegrade pass, a retrograde retrieval, a shuttle technique, it doesn't matter. And then you place your sutures and in the technique of Dr. Neer, you just flip the knots laterally. For those who, who talk to me about knotless repairs, this can also be done knotless. You simply pass a loop, pass your sutures through the loop, tie a knot, and pull it down. It's a knotless repair. So our evidence uh, has been reported over the last 10 years, and 
You know, this is more than 3,000 consecutive cases. I, I heard the question yesterday about the transosseous repair, if it was done in osteoporotic bone. I've performed this in every single case that I've done for the last 10 years. And the, re the healing of the rotator cuff in all techniques is, is reliably between 80, 85, 90% for one to three centimeter tears, somewhere between 75 and 85% for greater than three centimeter tears across all techniques. But I'll submit to you that try this and see in your hands if this is a little bit different for your patients because I do believe the recovery of pain and proprioception is indeed different. You know, I, I think there's a, there's a benefit and a, a risk for every technique that we perform. You know, we're going to, in another hour, I'm sorry I have to leave to go to the surgery. I'm going to use an implant that I've never used before. And we're going to talk about benefits and risks and, and move through all of this. But in every technique, you have to describe what is best for you and what is best for your patient. For me, the idea of, of things falling out of the bone, problems with the bone itself, the remplissage, what happens when you have a five millimeter tear in the infraspinatus that expands, all of these things are, are important to me because you have to know what you're doing to treat the patient. And for me, this is what I would rather have in my shoulder, what looked like something on the right and not something on the left. Thank you very much.